This PowerPoint lecture is on the clinical examination of the cardiovascular system. Topics to be covered include everything from the initial introduction to the general inspection from the foot of the bed, followed by a specific inspection of the hands, the arms, the face, the neck, the chest and the legs. Then palpation, then percussion, which is not uh, usually warranted in a cardiovascular examination, not for the heart anyway. Percussion, auscultation, special tests, maneuvers that may be uh, routinely performed, other systems and regions that may be involved, and uh, imaging, both primary, secondary and tertiary imaging modalities. Before we start the examination, you must be aware and be able to understand the cardinal symptoms of cardiovascular disease so that from the history you actually know that uh, you need to, do in, to examine the cardiovascular system and not the respiratory system or the endocrine or the nervous system or something else. So we need to go through, and this would be a separate lecture, the cardinal symptoms of tiredness, lethargy, presyncope, syncope, chest pain obviously, and one of the more uh, important symptoms, palpitations, shortness of breath with either at rest or during exercise or when you're at work, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, swelling of the ankles of the legs, and intermittent claudication. All these cardinal symptoms of cardiovascular disease we will cover in a separate lecture. The first thing you must do, especially as a medical student under exam conditions, is make sure when you introduce yourself to the patient that you smile, shake hands and make eye contact. Then you must explain what you'd like to do in simple lay terms so that the patient understands what you're asking them to do and uh, understand what you would like to do and they give their informed consent. They also must be aware that they have to expose their entire chest including their arms, neck and legs <clears throat> with a woman, making sure that obviously that they could still um, maintain uh, some sort of dignity and have their bra on and panties, or if they haven't got that in the, in the hospital setting, that's sometimes the case, then make sure you have appropriate uh, use of towels and sheets to make sure the patient's not uncomfortable and made to feel uncomfortable. The patient should be pos positioned lying at approximately 45 degrees <coughs> if they're able to, uh, arms just relaxed by their sides. Make sure every single patient that you wash your hands and wipe your stethoscope or anything else that you're touching the patient with with an ethanol swab. It's absolutely imperative that you wash your hands and your equipment between every single patient that you see. While your hands are drying with the alcohol solution, take the note of and play the game of Sherlock Holmes where you look at what's coming out from the patient. Examine everything that you can that's coming from them. We'll examine their sputum, vomitus, uh, stool samples if you have to. Look for any drain tubes coming from the patient, any catheter bags, nasogastric tubes, and make sure you examine the contents and uh, do it thoroughly as well. Also, look what's going into the patient. Are the patient on oxygen? Are they getting an IV drip? If so, what type of drip? What's going into the drip? Are they on a central venous catheter? What sort of medications are around the bed? Is there a nasogastric tube going in or a peg tube going in? Is there any uh, medication that, uh, that's up on the wall, up on the, uh, on the charts that you need to be aware of? Also, what's going on around the bed? Check for any special aids or orthotic prosthetic devices. Any information whatsoever that um, the patient has visitors, loved ones, family, friends, cards, balloons, flowers, all these sorts of things give us some sort of hint as the social um, uh, background of the patient uh, and anything else for that matter that gives us some idea before you even start while well, your hands is drying within a few seconds you should be able to determine these, um, these features of the patient. Also either do it now or later on make sure you check for the vital signs. Don't forget, many medical students do forget I think it's a nursing uh, topic or something there where they forget to take the temperature, especially that they forget to take the blood pressure. Usually they feel the pulse, but forget to take the respiratory rate. And most people now would consider O2 saturation uh, as, uh, as part of the vital signs. There's an added extra benefit. Very few patients these days are in hospital, especially acutely, without an O2 saturation monitor on their fingers. Now, before we even start now, take a general look at the patient and ask yourself the most important question. How sick does this patient look? How alert are they? 
do they need your urgent resuscitation before you continue to do your 10, 15, 20 minute full cardiovascular exam? Do they need the ABCs of resuscitation or are you able to just continue on and efficiently but not, not rushed do a full cardiovascular examination? Make sure you ask that question because there's a, there's a, every good physician would ask that question without actually verbalizing it. But juniors and medical students, we often don't do it and make sure you do. Make sure you just ask that important question right up front. Then ask yourself, is there any syndrome present? As a medical student, you probably won't know too many syndromes, but as you get more experienced, you may be able to spot the patient from the foot of the bed. That's not the end of the story if you do spot it, but it may give you some sort of hint and indication as to what to look for specifically. Look for Marfan syndrome, relevant. Down syndrome, Turner syndrome. There's a lot of things that could give us a hint as to what's going on in their cardiovascular system from the foot of the bed. Then systematically ask yourself this, these questions from this checklist. Each one will be asked no matter what you're doing, whether it's cardiovascular, respiratory, gastrointestinal, nervous, whatever. But it changes. The, the categories are the same, but the specifics are different. So each lecture in this series will go through the same set routine. Just like a top golfer would go through the same routine before every shot, all the best tennis players go through the same routine. We'll go through the same routine, but it's just varied slightly from a different perspective depending on uh, the system or region that we're examining. Look, first of all, for the posture of the patient. Any abnormal posture. In a cardiovascular, it's not particularly helpful, but in the others, as we'll find out subsequently, it is very important. Look for movements, abnormal pulsations, especially cardiovascular in the neck and chest and the precordium, or lack of movements. Uh, again, more appropriate for a stroke, but still cardiovascular. Look for muscle wasting. Either generalized cachexia is seen in serious end-stage cardiovascular disease, also seen in end-stage respiratory disease or liver disease or secondary metastatic cancer. But in this case, cardiovascular, look for generalized muscle wasting. Other types of examinations, you may want to look for asymmetries and asymmetry left compared to right, upper limb compared to lower limb distal compared to proximal, flexor compared to extensor. But these muscle wasting patterns, are all, they're all different depending on the perspective we're looking at. Here, we're just looking for generalized cardiac cachexia. Masses, again, not particularly helpful with um, cardiac. I suppose you could uh, draw a long bow and say xantelasma and tendon xanthometer would be our uh, masses, then they are small masses of cholesterol deposits subcutaneously. But uh, it's not a big issue here, but still ask the, the question or you'll miss obvious things. Next is skin changes. We always, always look for the three big things. Central cyanosis. Has the patient got blue lips and you'll examine it more closely later, but have they from the foot of the bed look like they've got blue lips and uh, maybe tongue? Look for and assess for anemia. They're not going to tell whether they've got anemia or not, but you may assess that they look a bit pale. And, but you've got to be careful because a lot of pale people around are normal. They've got to be pale compared to what they were like before they became sick or before they noticed the symptoms. It's a soft sign, uh, paleness, but nevertheless be alert to it and alert to the possibility and you'd need special primary investigations before you could determine whether they haven't got anemia. But certainly ask yourself, are they pale or not pale? Could be the cause of their cardiovascular um, symptoms having anemia. Next is jaundice. Uh, or from the foot of the bed, do they look yellow? This is a hard sign. Just like central cyanosis, a very hard sign. If you see it, they've got it. Whereas anemia or paleness, uh, they may or may not have. Uh, it just gives us a hint. Whereas jaundice is serious. Uh, they look yellow. As clear as yellow that you will also second, look secondarily when you uh, examine the eyes. They're important hard signs. Also look for the scars of previous or current surgery or the scars of previous or current trauma. And cardiovascular-wise, obviously look for the midline sternotomy scars or thoracotomy scars from valve replacements or operations on their chest and thorax. Could be cardiac, could be respiratory, <coughs> could be something else unrelated. But make sure you look and take note. If you don't ask yourself the questions, you'll miss things. Also look for bruising, both big bruises, pur purpura and ecchymoses. And also look for small little particular hemorrhages front of the patient and back of the patient. Don't miss bruising. Important signs if it's uh, not due to some obvious cause. 
look for. So generally speaking, it doesn't take long to look for pigmentations, look for stria, stretch marks, superficial veins, especially around the umbilicus. Uh, and just take note of anything else that may give you an indication of to what might be wrong with this patient. Then finally, we, um, we start with the hands. But we haven't actually started with the hands. I've already spent uh, 10 minutes in our introduction. But uh, many books uh, seem to get obsessed with starting from the hands. Yes, there is important signs to be seen, but no more important than, uh, than elsewhere, and arguably so. The hands are the, by far the best thing to be looking for. The most important thing to be looking for is in the cardiovascular system. Are uh, the hands warm and dry, which is normal, or are they cold and sweaty or cold and clammy, which is very abnormal and shows a peripheral shutdown? By far, that's the most important sign. Feel the hands. Are they warm or cold, dry or sweaty? And this is with the patient at rest, of course, not after they've been exercising. Also look for peripheral cyanosis and, uh, and uh, don't forget to peripheral perfusion also includes capillary return. Yes, blanch the, uh, the nail bread bed, blanch it until it's pale and then let go and then count how long, how many seconds it takes for the pink to come back. Should be instantaneous depending on the temperature. Uh, instantaneous, maybe up to two seconds, but no longer than that. Any longer than two seconds, is, uh, it shows a sluggish peripheral circulation and you'd be querying it, unless it was particularly cold, in which case it could be normal. Also look for the palm arc creases. It's a soft sign. Just uh, open up the palms, spread out the palm arc creases and see if they should be dark, darker than the, um, than the palm. Not a hard sign. People do have pale palmar creases and they're perfectly normal with no evidence of anemia. But it may give you a hint that they may have some. Certainly look for the, the yellow, as you see in this photograph, the yellow tar stains from heavy smoking. Telltale tar stains that uh, gives us some idea of the, uh, particularly one very important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Also, particularly in the Pacific Islands in the developing world, look for the stigmata of infective endocarditis. We see in the emergency department here in uh, Fiji, uh, every day we see patients with infective endocarditis. So make sure you check for the splinter hemorrhages in the nail beds, the oscillus nodes and Janeway lesions on the palm of the hands and the pulp of the fingers. And uh, also, last but uh, and, and least, would be clubbing of the nails. In cardiovascular, yes, it's possible. It's um, uh, much more likely that you'll be, you'll be due to another cause, but nevertheless, uh, take note uh, when you see clubbing, uh, then notice it. And it's uh, fairly obvious, you don't have to go through the routine of feeling the, the edematous nail bed or checking up for the angle, it's really they've got clubbing or they haven't got clubbing. So as, we, as you'll see in the next uh, photograph. So this is what clubbing looks like. If you think you need to uh, check this one and then have a good look at this, uh, all the fingers are the same. You're not going to be doing it on each finger. One thing, if one finger's got it, they've all got it. And uh, although there must be a progression to this, you very rarely see something in transition. You either be they got it or they haven't. By the time we see them, they look like this. That, this is clubbing and uh, don't mistake it and don't agonize over whether they have or haven't got it. They look like this, they're clubbing. If they haven't, then they haven't got clubbing. Next, move on from the hands, move on to the wrists. The, the two things you check for in an hour is the heart rate and the respiratory rate. But the heart rate, there's two aspects to it. You want to feel the peripheral pulse, the radial artery. The radial artery, you've got to know where to feel it. And it's then on the radial side, the thumb side, the lateral side of the wrist, in between the lateral two tendons. The tendon of brachioradialis and the tendon of flexor carpi radialis. Make sure you get the landmarks correct. In a young, fit, healthy medical student, it's easy to feel the pulse. In, a, in an elderly or sick or patient who has got hypovolemic shock or shock for any other cause, the pulse is difficult to feel, maybe. If you don't have the landmarks correct, you'll be uncertain and unsure of yourself. You must make sure you've got the landmarks that you understand and study the relevant surface anatomy. When you do pick up the pulse, there's two things you need to determine. One is the rate of the pulse. By all means, you should, in a normal circumstance, count for one minute and count the pulse rate. In an exam where you're stuck for time, you may, if you're lucky, be able to get away with a 15-second count and multiply it by four. 
But even then, if there's any indication whatsoever, which is the second part of the examination, is to determine the rhythm, whether the patient is in a regular sinus rhythm or whether they're in some sort of abnormal rhythm. At this stage, you'd be lucky to pick up anything other than AF when it's completely and utterly irregular. It's an irregularly irregular pulse of AF. That's all you'd hope to pick up for at this stage. But we can always come back. You can always come back if you think that there may be some other arrhythmia and check the pulse again. But at the moment, we just want the rate and over 15 seconds multiplied by 4 or more accurately, spread out over the full minute and certainly uh, ascertain the rhythm. If the rhythm is not normal, is not sinus rhythm, then definitely take the whole minute to, uh, to count the pulse and to assess the, uh, the rhythm of the patient and check for any uh, arrhythmias, especially if the presenting symptom includes palpitations. While you're at it, um, yeah, you may do radio radio delay. See if there's any disruption between the arterial supply from the arch of the aorta between the right and the left upper limb. Maybe or maybe not do radio femoral delay, although that's more uh, personal, and maybe that's more left better left for when you're doing the peripheral vascular, and you've explained yet again and even in more detail what is required of the patient. But at this stage, we can come back to this one. We don't have to do radio femoral delay up front. The same with the collapsing water hammer or pounding pulse of aortic incompetence, the pulses alternans of left ventricular failure, and other other subtle signs that you may want to come back to with the radial pulse to show off uh, your knowledge after you looked at the chest and the JVP and the carotid and you percussed or, or auscultated the, um, the heart, you may want to come back and uh, show off your knowledge of various subtle signs of the peripheral pulse. But at the moment, the rate and the rhythm, maybe radio, radio delay, leave the others till later. You can always come back to these signs. While you're at it, take the opportunity to count the respiratory rate, uh, a, a vital sign that uh, many medical students forget to do and don't appreciate the importance of it. Make sure you count it. While you're at it, so that you're not making yourself too obvious, take the pulse, do the rate, do the rhythm, and then check the respiratory rate again. Uh, just over 15 seconds and multiply by four. But uh, if there is a problem with the respiratory rate, if it's irregular or labored, you may want to do the full minutes, but 15 seconds is usually enough for most people clinically. As mentioned previously, you're palpating the radial artery by pressing gently the artery against the distal part of the radius bone. So, and also between the lateral two tendons, the brachioradialis, most lateral, and next is brachial is the flexor carpi radialis. Just in between those two lateral tendons, that's where you gently push the radial artery against the distal radius, and not too hard, or you may occlude the pulse altogether, but gently push and uh, ascertain the rate and the rhythm. If it's not there, some people have a difficult pulse to feel there. It's a rare, but it's a normal anomaly. In that case, you may want to go and palpate at the bottom of the anatomical snuff box, which we will look at later. And that way, you're now gently pushing the distal part of the radial artery against the scaphoid bone, which is at the bottom of the anatomical snuff box. Uh, so in those rare cases where you don't feel the radial pulse, maybe gently try the snuff box and see if that helps. If not, then uh, you start to query the... Uh, the peripheral pulse of this person on that particular side.